All right. So action items from the last time. Um, I was I, I was not here last time, so I will have to um, lean on you all to let me know how how that was going. But um, it looks like we were supposed to do a, a validate assumptions about JSON schema. Yep. Is there any yeah. Um, I think uh, specifically around the ability to generate code from uh, mm -hmm. from that, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I uh, posted um, at the beginning or I guess over the weekend or something mm -hmm. uh, about uh, using QuickType. Uh, QuickType is really cool, really powerful. It has some limitations. And although it does produce a functional uh, set of structs that could be used, I, I think um, the handcrafted ones are much more, uh, going to be much more pleasant to use. So my, my position is that we should continue to handcraft libraries, but that we should use JSON schema to aggressively validate uh, those handcrafted schemas. And so that it becomes a source of truth, but that doesn't mean that we have to generate all um, all uh, code implementations off of it because our mileage is going to ultimately vary. And it would also, you know, I, I, I thought a little bit about what that would look like in terms of just kind of like CI for changes. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, a change in version of the generator could change the output. It could even change our API. And so like, yeah, I, I think handcrafted uh, gener instead of generation with uh, JSON schema as the validator is going to produce better product and also result in us having less headaches in the future. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think uh, having gone through, uh, you know, doing all those um, structs in Go, um, I'll say that there is some, there is some like, sharp edges to that and i think that yeah like from what you're saying the the auto generated ones might have that more of those sharp edges and so that makes that makes a lot of sense to me anybody else have an, have an opinion on that okay um Backstage, or sorry, any any other comments on this before we go to go to the next action item? Okay, uh, backstage plugin. Uh, yeah, so uh, we now have a a repository in the OpenSLO org for uh, a number of different backstage plugins. Backstage kind of encourages uh, kind of decoupling on um, some of the the portions of logic into multiple plugins. Uh, so the repository is designed to host multiple um, uh, uh, JavaScript plugins for Backstage. I've created a bunch of issues about kind of the, the future work. Uh, I kind of put some of that work on hold as I proceeded to see what our, um, what our, uh, our uh, code generation strategy was going to be, because mm -hmm. we also need structs in for that uh, for uh, for that uh, plugin, um, so that's ready to go. I think it does actually raise the question of whether or not we want to create um, a uh, a JavaScript uh, library for uh, OpenSLO, just a generic one of, of JavaScript objects or not. Um, I think that might uh, be useful for this, but regardless. Uh, we're we're ready to to make uh, to make some headway on uh, on those backstage plugins. That's awesome. Thank you for yeah. thank you for doing that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and we have also npm organization open SLO uh, where we can put later artifacts from uh, backstage. So what what do you envision that uh, JS library? being like you said you were saying that we could represent the open slo objects mm -hmm. but um so what would be the, what would be the application for that 
Well, I mean, we're definitely going to need a representation of the objects for the backstage plugins, uh, simply mm -hmm. because they need something that they can store in, in memory. And in, it's TypeScript is what you write backstage plugins in. So mm -hmm. you can't just kind of wing it and just say, yeah, just do whatever, oh. whatever you want. So we need some sort of uh, some sort of typing in there. Um, that makes sense. And, and we can we can create a basic structure uh, for it starting in there, and then later evaluate whether it makes sense to to break that out into its own separate library. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's probably what I would advocate doing. Just start putting what the backstage plugins need, and in the future there may be some benefit to uh, to breaking those out. Similar to the benefit that we get from the Go representations, mm -hmm. um, just uh, that currently the only known uh, application for that is going to be backstage okay um that reminds me uh somebody was pointing out uh or kit, kit put a post in the uh, open slo slack about uh planomi uh does anybody here use that it would having a representation of this in uh, uh planomi or i can never pronounce it right but uh, would that be a so would that be something people would want what is that i'm not familiar um it is a it's kind of like a you know, it's another infrastructure as code library um like a framework similar to uh terraform um mm -hmm. but it uses a number of different languages like you can i think you can do it in like typescript um I I'm trying to remember the other ones. I think I think Go, and I'm trying to remember the other one. Yes, you can use Go. Yeah, yeah you can use Python. Rust there. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you spell it? P U L U M I. Uh, I do feel like I've heard something about this. How? Uh, I think this is, I think I heard about this because AWS said that they were going to start supporting some sort of an integration for cloud formation mm -hmm. uh, stacks with this. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious if there was anybody here that was using that, like whether we, it's something we should, we could uh, prioritize I, I think my or not. My former employer was looking into it, but I, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it looks nice. I just actually, I haven't actually run, run into anybody using it in production yet. So, um, cool. All right. Um, let's see. What's the next one? Um, uh, we agree that the schema should be put on the um, Open SLO website. Yes, that makes sense. Do we have any follow up with that? With this action item, was there was there any action that was required around this? I think there was an issue that was created on the website's repository. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can find it. Out of curiosity, publishing schema means that we need to have the schema in sync with the spec and the spec is the readme file. So either there's some magic that generates the schema from, or there will be some magic that generates the schema from the readme, which I'm not so sure about, or we start generating the readme from something semi-textual and semi-computer-like, or every PR that alters uh, the readme from some point in time in the future will also need to contain relevant changes to the schema thingy or fourth option that I haven't thought of. Do we have like a decision slash path slash something already in the works on that? I think I can clarify a little bit uh, just about what, what publishing the schema means. It specifically is that, so we, we do have a, a, a JSON schema definition checked into the into the repo now, um, and it is the full spec in JSON schema. JSON schema uh, has a kind of a model whereby, like, 
you identify individual schemas by a URL or some URI. And if you then serve it at that URI, all the JSON spec tools are already set up to actually just uh, scrape it from the internet. In, so then you could simply say, oh, I want to validate this thing against this thing. And then the tool will automatically scrape it from wherever, wherever it's served. So this specific thing that we were talking about isn't so much about like, putting like a pretty representation on the, on the, like, uh, on, um, openasolo.com, but rather just serving it at a sub path of, that matches the, um, the, uh, the IDs of the, of the schema documents. That being said, what you are raising is something that I think we probably mm -hmm. want, want to discuss, but I'm, I, I think that the thing itself isn't so much about like presenting the, uh, you know, for documentation purposes, it's more just for easier consumption of the already checked in schema objects. Okay, so from what I got from that is that TBD, the whole subject, like what we want to do with it in the future. I mean, not the specific action point here, but the thing that I raised about the syncing of the machine readable basically specs versus the human readable. Like we'll I, I think that that's something that would be uh, would be really good to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we might have a pretty straightforward way of doing it because right now, basically our readme file is full of a bunch of just examples. Uh, and JSON schema already supports an example section and, is, and the JSON schema files are just JSON files. And so, mm -hmm we could make you know, through set up some sort of, you know, pipeline step or something. I'm not sure that for validation or at least for automation that just scrapes the, the, the example uh, schemas that we can put in the schema documents and then we'll present it. Um, we'll present it there. Uh, and then also obviously have the, the, uh, the CI validate the examples against the schema itself. Um, I think that's something that, that, that could be done without too much difficulty, but we would need to obviously to further investigate. I think that makes sense to me. Um, like we have, have, have everything flow from the schema. Um, but yeah, Marish, to your, to your point, I think right now, yeah, we'll have to just manually make sure that we keep those in sync until we put a solution like this in place. What do we like? Manually keeping in sync means either someone at some point checks what changed and tries to update the schema, or at the CI level, we actually enforce that PRs need to update the schema as well. Those are sort of two different approaches. That might be hard on the CI level because if we just make, like if we're just updating a spelling change, um, like we would see a diff on the README but we wouldn't want to necessarily update the schema for like a, a spelling change or formatting change. Well, I, I think what we can do, and this might be a little difficult to explain non-visually, but there, there is a, uh, as I said, there is a part of a, of a JSON schema structure that is an example um, mm -hmm. uh, section. And again, it's just JSON, so it's easy to just, pull something out of there. Um, what we could have is some sort of validation that validates, A, probably have a tool that automatically can maybe do like some sort of templating on the readme document so that those examples are what actually get injected into the readme document. Second of all, on the CI level, we could do a validation that those things match what, you know, what, what we're checking in is what the C, what would be generated automatically. Mm -hmm. um, and then further, we can validate against the, the example documents against the schema just through JSON schema's own ability to just kind of self-validate the, uh, the examples. That way, any change that you make to the, uh, to the examples is something you're making to the schema documents. Mm -hmm. the CI validates that you have updated those in sync you really only had to make the change once and then just 
uh, use a script to just automatically update the, the readme file. And then the CI would also validate that the examples are compliant against the, uh, against the, the schema. Ultimately, it goes then a step further with a commit hook as well to make that script run automatically so to make sure they stay in sync. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What the what do examples mean? Because like when you started explaining it, the thing that popped in my mind immediately is that we could just since all changes that are not typos but actual changes to the schema, like schema to the spec, mm -hmm. are reflected in the embedded YAML examples in the readme, which mm -hmm. are easily extractable with a bunch of, like with some simple script, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then those examples can be validated against something that actually understands how bits of so when, when when I talk flow about, should look like. So yeah, but that's so, not what you're thinking about. Uh, I, there's one uh, extra step in there. It's very, very similar, but the, the extra step is, I'm not sure. I've maybe have you used Open a API specifications before? Uh, okay. In in both Open API specifications as well as in JSON schema, there exists in the in the JSON documents that you're writing a section just called examples, and it's just an array, and you can put in any number of documents that are just an example of this particular schema in play and our schema documents are, are broken into, into sub chunks. So it'd be very, each one of them could have their own example section so that there would be a corresponding example for every specific type that we're trying to represent in there. And so that could be the source of truth. And then using a template, we could just pull from there to update the examples that are in the readme file. That That's the step that you're missing. And on the other hand, what you're saying of like validate those with the JSON schema itself is, yeah, correct. Uh, I guess we shouldn't spend too much on the time on the subject, but like, like I, I've conflated the examples in the README versus the like sort of machine readable specification of like which uh, nodes are supposed to have which values and how be formatted. So the examples themselves are pretty uh, not, they don't cover everything. The examples are usually very short and there's not that much in them. So I don't think they would be a sufficient, uh, they, they, I don't think they would be sufficient unless we, we crammed like 20 times the examples in the readme, which I don't think is the greatest idea. So, no, the, yeah. the example section isn't uh, inside of JSON spec is, it's not something that actually gets used in the validation. It's just a sec, it's just for, it's a documentation section where you can just provide examples of the thing. Exactly the sort of sparse kind of incomplete examples that we have in the readme are the sort of things that would make sense to put in there. I didn't do it when I made my PR, just kind of out of time constraints, but I was going to just populate those example sections just straight out of what we have in the readme anyway. So, okay, I don't have any like more points on the matter. No. Cool. Anybody else have any have anything? Cool. Uh, all right. I think the next one was for the annotations um, in Oslo, which I think Ken was going or Ken made a PR for. Um, it looks like that, that it looks like that we got that all merged and taken care of was there any other follow up on that i'm not aware of any cool and let's see um let's see. and i think there's another one for issue 133 um was there, uh, it looks like there was, a, there was another PR for that one, the uh, to clarify the SLO alert policy. Um, was there any follow up for that? Uh, no, I think I did that. Let me just double check. Yeah, so I think that was done and merged. Okay. Cool. Um, 
33. I'll make a note of that. Sweet. Um, and then we're, I think we're continuing the discussion for the composite SLOs, it looks like, um, in 142. Um, was there anything anybody wanted to talk about right now while we have the meeting regarding the composite SLOs? I haven't necessarily been following if there's been updates I've missed, but one thing I'm particularly interested in there is about kind of weighting of the or or the kind of how do you how do you calculate the you know the up or down or meeting up based off of what you're bringing in do we want them all to be treated equally do we want some means to eval to weight different um different i guess sub slos differently uh I, I'm curious if there's been any further thought or um, investigation in that area. It's a good point. And I think that we should be flexible and basically allow to provide parameter weight. Uh, and uh, the particular, and for example, it can be whatever. And if, uh, one, uh, one piece can, for example, uh, have value 200 and the second will have value 100 and we have the uh, one third of the overall experience for the second one and so on so yeah it's i think it's easily achievable to have it like that to put this weights uh, for everyone basically uh, as a default everything is uh, weight equ equally and when someone puts some numbers some stuff yeah yeah uh, it's it's good idea i think uh, do we have uh, anywhere something like this in the discussion it would be worth to mention it in this issue if we if we are going to go with with kind of what what you're describing there i think it would probably make the most sense to just say that there's everything has an it has a default weight that say can be a hundred just the number yeah value a hundred and then Basically, you can omit that value. And then if you add one in, then everything, even if you have omitted them from all the others, but you add just against one, the others are documented as being assumed to be weight 100. Yeah, so, yeah. Or sort of thing like that. Yeah, sounds good. All right. It, would that cover the, I think one of the discussions in the issue right now is um, like the, single downstream SLO fails that causes every the entire composite to fail? Is that approach to just like weight that thing at like a million? And then if that, or I guess, I guess it gives you the individual, like this particular piece of the composite SLO is highly critical. Um, but I, I guess it, uh, it, it almost still feels, yeah, like maybe there's another piece that needs to be accounted for if you want that to be applied to everything equally, like every chunk of the composite equally, like any one failure results in a failure across the board. I, I think ultimately that depends on kind of what algorithm is used to actually, you know, roll up the weights into into one value. You that know. should be definable, like the like the algorithm. Like, do you mm. how do you treat something? If one at zero is enough to get everything at zero, or maybe it isn't, that would be like the the thing that you specify. I don't know what the common algorithms like approaches would be here, but I'm guessing, yeah, that that would be a thing that people using composite SLOs would want to investigate. I know there are papers on composite SLOs, so I would assume there would be inspiration in those. Yeah, I'm trying to look it up. There, the uh, uh, captain has a uh, a concept of this that they use, where there is like one that, like, if it like you can mark a SLI as like critical to the path, and like if it fails, the whole the whole thing uh, will go into a bad statement. But I'm trying to remember the the, the term that they use for that. It uh, feels like that needs to be this idea of a strategy for them. Then you know, weighted being one strategy, this critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some critical maybe being a strategy and then just a 
blanket like, like any single one fails it fails the whole thing mm-hmm. seem like three good strategies to start with yeah yeah i feel uh, like i want to kind of make sure we don't end up with essentially like a uh uh, an and or rules engine you know, yeah. that's kind of built in here like that seems probably too far um but yeah having i like the strategy idea jim to just say like this there's a, a few core sets that are like these are the yeah. most common use cases um collective well, it's extendable in the future if people really need to but that way it's limiting it preventing us from going down the path of writing code in yaml wasn't our approach beforehand on issues like this to just like show the implementer hey this is where you put your custom labels to 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 specify the details of the implementation that you need and be able to find to tweak the details of the implementation of this particular part of the spec that you need to be tweakable but the open slo spec as itself does not go too deep into the implementation because we don't want to like give you a whole algorithm or 20. We might uh, like suggest the common patterns are this, this, and this. And by the way, here's the blog post on our open SLO blog that we will going to have very soon now, like describing these in more detail, but at least initially for the PR to be merged, we would probably not want to be too specific about implementation details maybe a consensus will grow over time where like uh, accepting something as the overall structure makes sense but i'm not sure how we should like start with that if we should start with that i i, I think maybe some inspiration could be taken from kind of how backstage deals with its yaml format where they have some uh some um uh uh, keys that you can put any value you want in there, but there are documented a list of quote well known values and what those values then mean. And so we could have some sort of like you can imagine some sort of a key that says like strategy, and then we can document these are some well known strategies. Ultimately, you can put whatever your implementation will support in here, but these are some well-known strategies as like a jumping off point. I think this kind of ties back into um, some of the alerting validation that was looked at for Oslo, right? Was sort of saying like, which of the providers will support this this type of alerting strategy? And it seems like the same pattern that we're looking at here where you have that flexibility, but then you have another system, maybe Oslo, that's, that does the, the correlation for you to tell you will sloth do this will noble nine do this will you know whoever do the other ones okay was there any other discussion on this that people wanted to have is it worth discussing because I know there was discussion, some discussion in the issue around whether a composite should be like adjusting what's there today or a separate type or like within the same type. Uh, do we want to discuss that at all as to like how it's actually represented? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. I think we can discuss it a little bit because yeah. um, uh, uh, for now uh, we have multiple objectives in the SLO and every objective is pretty independent. So we don't have one numerical value, one metric from the SLO uh, to plug it into another SLO as an input. And here with this proposition from issue with composite SLO, so basically we do it like that, that every objective is a part of the composite SLO and that by the defining composite on it, we have the single metric number generated by SLO, this composite SLO, and we have barnet, et cetera. Um, 
uh, for it and referencing it for uh, another defined SLO is a little bit uh, tricky or maybe not because uh, this SLO uh, should have only one threshold to have one value which is the input for the other SLO because uh, do I understand you correctly can that basically you mean about nesting SLO in SLO right it's it's how, how are we going to represent it without yeah. making it too confusing for anyone who's either already using the spec today or mm -hmm. might want to use it tomorrow and doesn't necessarily need to worry about composites yeah I mean that for example someone has a service a define SLO service B define SLO maybe service C define SLO and one day think I want to put something on it as a whole because it's a for example user journey and uh, she can reference the the existed one into this new one and I think for this probably we should think about it and maybe about a new kind but for this use case as uh, described in the issue in this composite I think it can be def defined and uh, included in this current SLO flow that basically I have objectives and I put composite on it and it's uh, related to those objectives to those, those SLIs and so on and what you proposing we should have separate discussion about it and figure out how to do it the best it's just my thinking what do you think yeah I, I'm open to options I'm just uh, I think unsure of the best way to represent it that means it's not super confusing for anyone coming to it and trying to do just non-composite SLOs um so and then to ensure that anything for anyone using the spec today doesn't get really confused about where things go tomorrow if its composites are handled within the existing SLO object mm. yeah so I, I you you mentioned something uh Jacob, about uh the about the, the fact that yeah we have already in one SLO multiple objectives supported and yeah, I, I think that does that that is something we're gonna have to think about really carefully because of the fact that let's say we do create a new composite SLO type that references some other SLOs that 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 make it up. Should should they reference the objectives of those SLOs? If it's if they just reference the SLO uh, object itself. Are we implying some sort of Cartesian product of all the uh, of all the SLO objectives that make it up, or or whatnot? I I, I don't know what the, what the right balance is for that. But me too. As, as you were describing that, that that I started thinking about that. And yeah, sweating a little bit. Yeah, and when you start to think about, for example, referencing SLO inside SLO, and maybe the other SLO inside, you know, the nesting of it and so on it uh, it it became tricky because what is proposed in this issue is basically objectives are pretty independent so define in every objective whatever you want and encapsulate for example the user journey like uh, shopping cart or something adding product at the shopping cart in one slo all of the services and you can have the health and meaningful SLO for it and with weights you have for example can uh, as you mentioned this uh, weighting of the particular uh, objectives may be very important because for example clicking button buy uh, should have should weight much more than for example clicking additional information about product or something like that in terms of the urgency to wake up oncal engineer and you can capture inside the composite slo those nuances and the whole user uh, story this is my yeah hot take uh point of order like you're at two-thirds of the call and we're still at the reviewing stuff from yeah last bit, oh. so we should probably rush through the 
Yeah, you I stop. think let, let, let's keep talking about this, this, this uh, composite and keep the discussion going in the uh, ticket for right now. Uh, but that's a good point. Um, all right. I think that was it for um, old old items. Um, uh, oh, except for the pro or so except for the obsolete boards, uh, which looks like uh, Cuba uh, took care of removing uh, and talk and it looks like we want to uh, want to have a roadmap discussion um, here and so we can continue so we can do that after we have these first few items. Um, does anybody have an objection to that? Cool. Um, for the open SLO website, I think uh, we'd be talking about updating that, getting it more dynamic. Uh, we're going to actually have uh, somebody from um, Noble Nine join, but I think he he got wrapped up in something else. But um, talking about adding a blog, um, and we do have a Twitter account for open SLO if people are interested um, as core contributors to uh, contribute to either of those. Um, uh, is there anybody that's interested in 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 contributing those? Yep. Yeah. Cool. I'm well, not you. Twitter. I don't use Twitter. You don't do Twitter. That's cool. That's fine. Oh, but yeah. for the blog, yeah, like, um, we have the uh, I I I can clean up the uh, Hugo. Uh, so we get we're, for the, the the website right now. We just use Hugo. Um, I can I need to clean that up because that was done, uh, very hurriedly over a night. <laughs> There's a lot of things to be, uh, cleaned up there. Um, How old is it? Because there was a big change in Hugo, and now current Hugo pipelines tend to break. <laughs> oh no! Uh, I hope not. Uh, this it was works. done like. Yeah, it it was works. This... Uh, I I installed yeah. Hugo from Brew and checked something locally, and it it, it works. So okay. Um. Uh. Yeah, it was. I think it was. This was done about a year and a half ish ago. Um, but yeah, it was right, right before like the, we did the announcement uh, of the of the project. Um, so yeah, we need to add that. Also, we want to add some of the new projects to like the the top. Like we want to add like the backstage stuff. We want to add slow gen and all of that um, to to the website too. Um, but uh, starting out with just blogging on Twitter, so people so we can hopefully get some more interest around it, get some more people engaged. Um, if there's anybody else that's interested in um, contributing to that, let me know, uh, and we'll we'll get you going on that. Um, yes, so I, I could be open to contributing. I'm I'm not sure what uh, what if I have any particular content in mind, but uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, just anything that's like SLO or open SLO. Uh, 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 related like how you guys are using backstage would be a cool one um i think although i yeah. think you said you might you might be do, doing that for your work already i can't no i'm this. actually I'm, I'm my my employers asked me to, to put together just kind of a write-up on uh, just how to implement slos kind of end to end because they want to kind of put that in the hands of some developers to just try to get them to just kind of start on their own working at mm -hmm. currently we've been doing kind of a SREs push in and consult with the team and mm -hmm. trying to get that to work more at scale. So okay. I put a draft of what I've been writing there. It's uh, it's it's meant to be kind of opinionated and prescriptive. Okay. I'm not sure if that's a, a great candidate for uh, for the uh, SLO okay. blog, but yeah, I've I've definitely written a, a lot about SLOs in the past, so I'm I'm definitely open to uh, to continuing to help there. Okay. Uh, Marius, time slices. Yeah. Uh, so current time slices. If if you compare the implementation of the occurrences uh, budgeting method of SLO calculation is like the default naive implementation. You take all the good things, all the good data points, and divide them by the count of all the ta total data points, and you get the like window performance. With time slice calculation, as they are currently defined in spec, you need to additionally define the time slice window, as in the whole window is slashed into, say, like 10 minute increments. And within those 10 minute increments, you then need like a 
it's called time slice target. It's essentially a threshold. If the performance of that little time slice is below the threshold, then it's a fail. And if it's above a threshold, then it's a one, basically one and a zero. And then you average all those one and zeros for all the time slices and you get the final performance of the full time window for the SLO. However, we've also discussed, and it's probably, it was probably last year, that maybe what if instead of qualifying each time slice as either pass or fail, we just used the float that you get, like the performance in the time slice itself, the float itself, as the thing you feed into the whole average that gets you the final SLO performance uh, metric, essentially. And the simple, since I'm since I'm working on relevant things and actually need open SLO to possibly cover that option, I came up with the idea that the easiest way to be able to specify it is that, hey, the, okay, the budgeting method is time slices, but you also specify what kind of calculation within those time slices you want either the target one where you define time slice target which is what's currently in spec and it would be the implied default for backwards compatibility or the ratio where you don't have to define a time slice target because the actual ratio of good to total within the time slice would be the value that you need uh, just wanted to run it quickly, like uh, thoughts. I can specify it fully in an issue or a PR so we can discuss it further. Just an uh, like loose idea whether that sounds like the way to go, basically. What are your thoughts on just a completely new budgeting method? Right now there's occurrences and time slices, just having it be weighted time slices. Yeah, but like those aren't weights. Like we just discussed in the composite, uh, in the context of the mm -hmm. composite SLOs, weights. Weights mean something else. Got it, got it, got it. To be honest, if I were to redo the spec now, I would go with time slices mean what the ratio wants and uh, target time slices mean what we currently have as time slices. As in, Time slices require an additional thing that you need to define, the time slice window. And then the more complicated target time slices also require you to define the target. Like the complexity grows like that. Maybe they can be called tar uh, ratio time slices as a, an additional budgeting method. I'm not sure. Like this is, yeah, that would also work. So either this or adding ratio time slices. Uh, generally, like no one's super opposed to having a sort of third type of half type of budgeting method, hopefully. Yeah, I, I think uh, ha having a third one as opposed to changing the, the existing time slice is going to make it keep keep the, the structure flatter and thus easier for people to parse. Um, so as opposed to just make changing how the the current time slice functions in in a different way that just deepens the 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 possibilities in the in the current uh configuration yeah like my idea was that the if you don't specify the time slice calculation or name it something better then the implied one is the target one which is what's currently available no no of course i i, I understand that i but i i'm saying your approach should uh, make sense to me to, to promote to like a peer, but slightly different as opposed to a, a spin on, on the existing one. Um, I think it would also simplify validation for um, platforms that want to verify, like, can I accept this open slow definition? Yes or no. And mm -hmm. it's just easy to like, it, this is a, a budgeting method that we have or we don't have versus like, this is a budgeting method we have, but it also has these additional fields. Can I make sense of those fields? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll create an issue with the ability to vote sort of, and then I'll get like a few, like specify this and the ratio budgeting method as the secondary option and like emojis or something. And we can figure out which is the preferred solution. Yeah. How about that? I think, 
on 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 first blush like th this does make a lot of sense to me and yeah i think like like um uh, uh mike and diego were saying like yeah i think having it as its own type separate type makes a lot of sense too okay so i got my like next steps i'll take it from there cool thank you um um and um okay so for, for the roadmap discussion um what i'm i'm curious I, I, so since i wasn't here last month uh for the discussion what do, has there been any uh discussion per, um on this already or uh what were people's thoughts basically the main thought was that we want to make this roadmap easily accessible on our official website mm -hmm. and that we need to plan this roadmap and to start thinking about it to make open slo more reliable when someone think about adopting right it's always mm -hmm. better to show that per the project is moving and it has the roadmap basically because mm -hmm. we had some obsolete issues like for example required for version uh, v1 uh, v1 but uh, we released already v1 so yeah and so on so yeah, yeah, I think they embrace it as well as uh, just internally in my company wanting to have a better sense of where is the spec heading? What kind of big features might be coming in six or twelve months to get get a sense of okay when we can target implementing feature X internally in like twelve months because OpenSLO will have implemented by then and those kinds of things. Okay, so would okay, so I guess the first step making a new project. Yeah, uh, since these, since these were the, the ones we had were, were closed. I think the next piece is like so Ken to your point uh for the issues that we have like the ones that you want to like target like um is I'm I'm trying to think of what what a, what a good way to identify those high priority items that people want to have tackled would be um uh well I, I guess we could utilize the I guess upvoting and github issues is one way mm -hmm. to do that and prioritize based on uh how many votes something has um otherwise i'd say probably in these meetings someone or a group of people raising a particular issue that needs to be worked on because it's blocking work of theirs mm -hmm. uh etc but i i think it, it it mostly boils down to um regular planning as part of these meetings i would say to add things as to okay we're planning a release in like three months these are the things we want to have as part of it and then these other items might be for the next release but we don't have a specific date for that yet just to kind of get a sense of uh progress and growth uh, i think with the project and community so are you to i uh so it, it sounds like you, you're you would propose a like a a planned release schedule. Um, I don't particularly mind whether we take the approach of uh, time box releases or feature driven releases. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say if we are doing time box, it's probably good to have maybe a couple of things in terms of features that we are targeting for that time box release even though it's mm -hmm. time box um otherwise we will find that those time box releases will just be oh it's a bunch of 10 bugs that have been fixed and no new features were added kind of things um but that's just my perspective okay does anybody have any an opinion on that um what I'm thinking yeah, yeah so maybe we could have um so one of the things with that with this uh, uh so like instead of having like I guess we could have multiple 
like releases in one of these projects. So we'd have, like how we had previously, like the one Oh, I think we can add the releases to the issues and add those to have different projects for that. Is that what people are kind of thinking? I think that boils down to whether it's time box or feature. Mm -hmm. um, if it's feature driven, uh, let me think about this. If it's feature driven, then you, you probably would have a project board for each release. Mm -hmm. um, if it's time box driven, you'd probably just have a, a Kanban of this is stuff to do, this is stuff that's done, and then mm -hmm. use the milestones to assign, okay, this is done for this release. Yeah. Uh, um, but again, that's just my perspective on things. But like, isn't the nature of the project itself that it's like uh, stuff changes over time without a plan or like people pop in and out and do stuff, contribute, don't disappear for a month or two because they're busy with other stuff. So if we want to have releases at all, then every once in a while, just take what's there, try to stabilize, finish something like polish it, et cetera, and release that as a new release versus trying to stick to a schedule and have to actually do the planning. Like if the, just reg, doing regular re releases with what we have indicates to anyone looking at the project that the project is alive and how much stuff is in a given release, like what's the Delta difference between releases will vary across time for with like uh, things that no one controls because this isn't like a company that all works on a single stuff and can decide. These are people that either do it, don't do it, come up with an idea, have a need, etc. So I would say that a time based on a cadence would be more natural to how the project operates. So I yeah. think the only, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Sorry, Ian. Um, yeah, I think from the consumer point of view, it seems like a good incentive to know that if you're driving for the um, addition of some functionality into the spec, that you can predict that that'll be like part of the the main uh, spec at some point soon-ish versus if like either the composites one's a pretty good example, like we know we want to get in there, but like if that's going to be six months or a year out, it's hard to know how much you should be pushing for that um, inclusion or whether it makes sense to like fork the spec and then, you know, have your own weird separate branch for a little while. So um, I have, I agree that having the timelines to work backwards from just can be a good incentive um, for even the community for us to like contribute things because we know it'll get out by a certain point and we can build that into our roadmaps. Yeah, and we can like not uh, merge very large uh, PRs at the last minute to be, so that we are not surprised where it's inconsistent too much. Yeah, yeah. Like that. absolutely. Like, can keep the same sort of blockers if there's like, if it's not a good state, it shouldn't get releases, shouldn't get cut. Um, but having the general idea of like aiming for this many releases per year or whatever um, gives like a general idea to work backwards from. Since we agreed this is Semver, then like it will be 1.n, 1 1.n one plus one. And hopefully we won't ever get to a point where we need to like be super backwards and compatible and need to release like a 2.0 or do we want to release a 2.0 for the glory of it yeah. I, I was i was just gonna gonna raise that point as well that like yeah if we're gonna do that let's let's stick to to minor uh releases planned and major releases exceptional sorry is minor releases planned major what exceptional basically like well if we're only when we're really sure we want to break some backwards compatibility mm -hmm. or for the 10 year anniversary of open as always a project um yeah it, that, this makes sense to me like just like having knowing that we like we're going to release on the cadence the versions can change depending on what we're actually putting in there but just to, like committing to a timeline committing to a cadence um that makes sense um but i think the one thing with this is if there's ever anything that we need like any sort of like hot fix that we need to throw in there which i think we'll we should have the flexibility to be able to say like we can't do that like and 
the other thing is I want to ask the other thing I want to ask is like, do, do you guys see this uh, uh, extending out to Oslo, or should Oslo be feature uh, driven? I kind of feel like Oslo should be feature driven, but um... well, I, I think some of that gets to what you and I were discussing. I can't remember whether it was Slack or a GitHub issue the other day whereby if we can have Oslo in a place where it's not tied to a specific spec of a version of OpenSLO, that it can work mm -hmm. with any, even if it's released before a version of a spec is released, mm -hmm. then I think it's definitely possible for Oslo and should be like feature driven. Um, if it needs to be hard tied to what OpenSLO releases are available, at the time it's released, uh, then it might have to be a mix of feature and time to be able to release once there's a new spec available. That makes sense. So I guess, a, yeah, so a prerequisite then for Oslo would be to, yeah, pull out the specs or the, the structs from, from it and pull in from the main project. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my takeaway right now is I'll, I'll I'll add a new GitHub project. If people want to like vote on the tickets that they want to like see, uh, we, we can start adding those in. I also want to make sure everyone understands that like you know that I'll make the project, but I, I'm not I'm not going to be the, I don't have to be the guardian of it. If people have things that they want to put in there and move tickets around, like please do. Um, I think the last time around, I think uh, I, I, I don't I, I, I was, I'm worried that people thought that it, like that was just for somebody else but it's for everyone so please move tickets around as as they seem necessary and reprioritize if they seem necessary this is for us all okay cool. if we're taking a going to take a time-based approach like do we want to set a when would the next release be based on that time-based approach Would you want to do uh, quarters or something more frequent, Mike? I feel like starting with quarters makes a lot more sense. And then if we feel that we can actually pick up a velocity yeah. that makes monthly or more frequent makes sense, let's do that. But start slow. Okay. Walk, crawl, one. Walk, crawl, walk, one. Yes, there we go. Great. Sweet. I'm with the chat. Time to publish it as an SLO that we're uh, going to release that uh, frequently. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And I'll see you all next month or in Slack. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye. See ya.